Well, I would like to uh, welcome the audience who will hopefully show the kind of interest that this program rewards. And I would above all like to welcome the Meister himself, Peter von Bach, to whom the festival dedicated a rather huge program with 15 films, actually 15 programs with actually some few, uh, some films more, short and feature length films, which actually only make up for about one fourth of his oeuvre. So what you're getting to see here in the next 10 days is something like the tip of the iceberg. So we only saw now one film up till now and so maybe also to get people interested in, the, in, your, in your work in general, could you talk a bit about really how you actually always get at your films? I mean, when do you actually know that you have a new film? How do you start a project? Well, it's, uh, it's most likely that it's, it's only, only kind of one, one flashing idea, kind of one image, and, mm. then, and then it starts. That I never, never write scripts at all. Mm. Nothing is written in advance. But on the other side, I write enormously yeah. during the filming. Mm. That I kind of make notes and in a way develop it. And I, I just to had, had a notebook. Mm. I took one, one notebook with me when I left home to, uh, this morning and then I found uh, by a chance notes for Helsinki mm. that I had written, written. there were ten, ten pages that went along filming and most of the <coughs> most of the things that I had written down were not in the film. Yeah. So it, it so happens that, that it's by, by developing something entirely else so we come, come to the come to the point. So it's, it's, it's very typical that with this film in, uh, about Helsinki, so mm. I had certain images that uh, I, uh, certain few images mm. in the beginning that I thought that they will stay until the end and certain music choices mm. and none of them are, are then in the film. So it's oh. very, very complicated what happens that some of the best images, they, they are dropped out mm. And some of the very mediocre images come in, and they mm. serve better, better the purpose. Yeah. Is there actually uh, a desire to come back to certain images in your, and also to come back to certain films? For example, you are almost obsessive with two films from 1939, with Ezef Parati and Avo Vetein, which pop up again and again and again all over your oeuvre. <coughs> it's. Um, it's very interesting, by the way, that, that uh, this kind of retrospective takes place because, because it's, uh, it's uh, almost an experiment, almost a cynical experiment mm. that, <laughs> that you are offered something that has never been shown outside Finland. And nobody knows, knows if it's worth, worth showing. Finns certainly didn't think, think it, it would be shown ever, ever. It was during 40 years, most of these films were made for the television. So, so uh, not once the films, any of the films was offered out of Finland for, for foreigners. Nothing was subtitled. So Rotterdam had done a tremendous uh, thing, thing about that. And, and uh, the, the thing, obviously, the difference between you and, uh, you and me is that, that for me there are that images that are enormously poignant for me, mm. like the two films you mentioned, I, I think it's very perceptive to they pick, pick them up, because, because they, they are film, films that are of no, no very uh, obvious cinematographic value. Mm. They are not, not uh, appreciated at all. But they have something that I kind of, uh, my nose says that they are, they are the kind of very basic truth about mm. a lost time. Yeah, and that's that, That's the kind of uh, thing that I I really that makes me permanently interested about this kind of collage film or compilation film is that that um, well Marcel Proust needed thirty pages to to get get the sense of lost time, but here we can from one take. One shot for, from one mediocre film, and you get, can get get the idea already. And you are already you are somehow walking in the past, 
And I think it's, it's like, uh, I, I sometimes think that it's like, like the short story of Anton Chekhov, Chekhov, Chekhov that, that um, he, he liked to describe, the, uh, to have the do mediocrity as, as evidence, not the most brilliant images. If I would kind of do a film like uh, any of my films, with 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 uh, so so called masterpieces of Finnish cinema it wouldn't reveal anything but i mostly i i get most joy by using bad materials mediocre materials things that then in a way they're enjoyed by 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 big public so inside of these images there there is the dialogue between audience and and these films during the war time for instance films were, uh, were, were seen by half a million films, each film, the most, the worst of them was shot, seen by half a million in a country that then only had, had three million inhabitants. So the trace of these, these cinema experiences, this kind of exchange of, of emotions is in these images. And in a way, I'm, I'm kind of, as a director, I'm, I'm filming these things and not, not really mm -hmm. these images only. It's something invisible that there's, there's behind. So, I mean, you are very much concerned about the, or the idea of audiences. So isn't it for you to a certain degree rather rewarding to actually see the films now in cinema? Because I always thought it's somewhat perverse that the films were made for television. Because the television audience something very much splintered up. But I think you are somebody who's really fascinated by people coming together in one place. Yeah, well, also as a festival it's a, maker. Well, it's a, it, it changes the film obviously, but but the origin of these films is mostly that they have been shown in television, and some some had had tremendous audiences in Finland. Some of these films, so it it, it means that fin, uh, the audiences wanted to cope with uh, with uh, with these themes and with these uh, these emotions, and in a way they were having notions about, uh, about what happened to their parents and so on. They, they, it's a kind of secret history of Finland. It's a, and the definition I have about, uh, about Schlager, the popular song, yeah. in, in one of these films, uh, I think it's Sydney Times, Blue, mm. Blue Sky, is that a that, uh, popular song is a secret history of, mm. of a nation. And, and I think it goes to the images, these images also, that, that this kind of, it's a paradox that, that uh, these are obviously films that uh, with good reason were, were not, not shown anywhere abroad. Mm. And they were even, even they are also, also films that also Finns now think that, okay, they are, they are lousy films or bad films. But then, then uh, they can offer, offer us, us the more truth than, than the masterpieces of the period. Is that that so certain degree holds true? F to, is true more or less always for cinema that actually the masterpieces are the, the films that to a certain degree almost go against what we are looking for in cinema. Hmm. Probably, probably yes, yes. Also, I was thinking thinking that one of the when I mentioned that that certain films were dropped out, so there are fantastic images from from Helsinki mm. at war. Yeah. During the war period, there are are such films, great films. And I was in the beginning, starting the film, I was, I was um, definitively going to use these images. But uh, the point is that there is nothing. I didn't leave any any of them. Yeah. And and then only when the film was made and it had already been presented, so I remember that uh, that shit. I didn't, I didn't use those images. And then, then I, I started to think what had happened. And then I understood that the way of reflecting about how profoundly war scarred the nation, how, how profoundly it kind of made everything different. The only way is not to show it, but, but to, to let those emotions linger there. So actually, actually, you could say that it's all, all, all about the influence of war, mm. civil war first, and that's why I come back to the, to the several wars in yeah. the end. So they, in a way, they, they, they show the point at last. 
So that's also is that also a reason why in your film that is to a certain degree about the war, it's actually the film where you mainly work with interviews with the last summer 1944. Yeah. Well, there are uh, there are different kinds of film here. Some some work with with uh, with, with interviews, and then then again, Helsinki has doesn't have any, and or or the newest film that is called Splinters, which is also also using all the arts, mm-hmm. using painters, uh, paintings, and literature, and so on. So so uh, they don't have any interviews. But I have been always always I, I always hated this uh, this. Uh, negative uh, uh, description of, of films that are uh, about talking heads mm. yep. because because uh, human face is, is uh, the greatest subject cinema ever had yep. so even even with with the document it all depends that i i, I would never uh, never film uh, anything with with so called specialist or so but they are always always people who experience certain things And so they are, they are probably much more interesting, the faces, than, uh, than if, if there would be kind of mechanical illustration of those situations. I mean, another thing you do that a lot of people find rather hmm is actually that you do work a lot with, um, with voice-over, which is actually fun, one of the strengths of your films for me. Not only because you've got such a wonderful voice, but you write such extraordinary voiceovers, which are very forceful, very fast, very poetic, very poignant. Is this something you would... Did you ever really try to do something without uh, the voiceover? The voiceover seems so important to you, the voice itself. No, well, well actually, actually, it's the other way around. Yeah. That in the beginning, that because you, you, you haven't seen uh, all of them, so... so in the beginning, only the film called Blue Sky, yes. which is shown, I think, tomorrow, has, has a voiceover, yeah. commentary. But otherwise, I did, did 20 years mm. films with absolutely the idea, uh, absolute conviction of not, mm. not using commentary. Yeah. So I didn't, didn't use commentary until lately. Mm. And now I'm kind of keen on commentary again. I don't know why, but it's, it's a kind of... Because I, the point obviously is that if you are doing one and same film with, with commentary or without, so making it without commentary is much more difficult. Mm. Because then you must kind of, every cut is, is, uh, is, is so, so difficult that if you fail one cut, the whole film goes apart. You must, everything must go like a machine. So, so, so it's easier to do with, with commentary. That's one, one thing. But, but uh, I think, think the originally I was, I was um, one of my, um, if I would have, have some mentors in life. So one of them was uh, somebody, a great friend who was, uh, was a New York filmmaker whose name was Emil De Antonio. And he became, I, we, have, we have talked, we have, uh, I have at home tapes, uh, 50 hours of discussions with him, never published or so. Oh. But his big convi- conviction from, from a, uh, his wonderful first film, Point of Order uh, onwards, was, was that no commentary at all. He didn't use commentary for Milhouse or In the Year of the Pig and so on. So, so I was under that, that idea and I, I'm very happy that I did all these films. Uh, year 1952 is without commentary. Yes. Paavo Nurmi is without commentary. So they are typical of that period. But they do have a voice. I mean, there are voices in Paavo Nurmi. Yes, but they are, they are all uh, citations. Yes, There is no, no written commentary in that. It all, yeah. all comes from, from, from the soundtracks and, and often radio soundtracks. Radio was a tremendous influence yeah. in my life because it's in my generation. I didn't have, have television, uh, uh, television during all my school time. It came so late to, the, to, to where I lived. And, and so, so I was listening to radio, and radio is something that, that kind of liberates your imagination, and that's perhaps the same effect I'm, I have been always after, that, that to, to do kind of radio, mm. in the spirit of radio, yeah. sooner than, than doing, doing what documentaries yeah. are supposed to be. One should say that your earlier films are more, let's say, rigorous in their structure. I mean, I think your later films are far more free-floating. I mean, that's actually something that I think the first film of, you, of yours that I saw was your second documentary on Olaf Iverta, 
which is very rigorously stu structured. Yeah. It's really like tong, tong, tong. And you basically find, uh, find that also in some of your other earlier films. And it's only with your later films and with a comment that the films start to really flow. Yeah. Well, in, well even an idiot learns something in life. <laughs> even the Finn? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but it's. Uh, did you? Is this something you were consciously looking for? This plurality of voices, or is this something that more or less really developed unconsciously? No, it's unconsciously. It's, it was. It was evident. It, it happened for the first time in in, in Helsinki because because um, it's um, it's not not too evident probably for the foreign uh, because you need, need you see there writer yeah. names and they are always always the other male voice and and mm -hmm. the female voice are are reading reading them yeah and so because because you don't know the writers nobody knows knows them outside finland some some are known but but most mostly not but it's it's um, it's now now i have uh, used it a couple of times that and it's uh, it's uh, it's anyway the uh, it's a kind of form that I'm searching, and also, also I think that the, the latest films uh, are, are much more enterprising in the in their development of time. Yeah. And because because otherwise, in the with with year 1952, so you have linear, you have the linear idea of the what happened during the year, and of course that's the biological. Mm -hmm. cycle of the year that is a subject that you couldn't break it but but with, with Helsinki and then the new film splinters there is there is kind of enormous jumps all the time and I'm, I'm, I'm actually <clears throat> I've been thinking that that it's their structure is as complicated as any any French uh, nouveau roman French new uh, new wave novel, yeah. but uh, in the way that any spectator can look at the film and not to be dropped out out of it, as often happens with experimental films. Yeah. So then, even if Helsinki film has, has a very complicated time structure that it goes goes seventy years there and back and there, I have never I have not yet met a spectator, a spectator who, who would say said that it, it was difficult for yeah. me. It doesn't happen. That it's as, it should be as easy as, as, as kind of any, any... But it's also because it's very, very well structured spatially. I mean, you basically walk through Helsinki, through the different districts, cross again and again certain landmarks in the center of the city. So, I mean, it's, the orientation is really more spatial than uh, time-wise. Yeah. It's true, and, and also also it's a, it's a love letter, no, perhaps not as much to Helsinki mm. as to the artists that were reflecting Helsinki. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's why I kind of uh, and and also also amazingly many of them that it it makes uh, the film relatively personal because because I knew so many of them. Yeah. So I'm communicating with, with all these filmmakers that, that I, in a way, I have been around enough mm. to have known, known all of them, all, all the artists, all the actors. I have known more of them. So, so in a way, when they are there, so I'm, I'm kind of talking with them. Yeah. So, so it's only one of the kind of reasons why I, why I think, I, I always thought so, that the compilation film is the most personal of all film uh, genres. That it's, it's, you always think that if you write a film and then you make a fiction film, so that's a personal. But it's, it's nothing compared because here you are preoccupied with pure form. Mm -hmm. That you must with form and very pure elements and also, also relating things and your memories about the past and your imagination of the past. You, you get so many more levels. Yep. And, and the testimony of all the arts. Here you have the painters, what they said, what the writers wrote about Helsinki what the filmmakers, how they develop the images and all that. So it's, it's kind of enormous treasure. Yeah. I was just signaled that we are almost through time-wise. So I hope that all of this made you a bit more curious to see all the other films. And 
I'm afraid we will have to call it a day now. I, I've been wondering wh how much the organizers my, uh, my, uh, must pay for a person to get uh, some people in to, into this. Uh. Well, I guess much. <laughs> so, thank you very much and I hope we will see you in the next few days and I guess as this is a big thing for both of us, be certain to not miss the film Kardec San Solomon Lord, yeah. Eight Deadly Shots, which is arguably one of the greatest films ever made. <coughs> if you yes, want. well, uh, it's it's a it's a very uh, very singular privilege you are you you can can have tomorrow because uh, really this film that is more than five hours, Eight Deadly Shots, it's it's considered by all of us in Finland to be the great Finnish film. Aki Kaurismäki thinks so, for instance. And it has been never shown in its entire length, in its uh, real duration outside of Finland. This is the very first showing. It has been shown as a short version and that doesn't play well. It's, 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 it's a parody in comparison. It's, it doesn't have the truth. So it's, it's something that, that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you will be happy if you witness that event. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Peter.